Venus flytraps. Sundews. And pitcher plants. All of these have managed to survive in the harshest of environments. Thanks to their one shared trait. Carnivory. Carnivory, or more specifically a carnivore, is an organism that derives its energy and nutrient requirements from a diet consisting mainly or exclusively of animal tissue. For hundreds of years, people would travel to the edge of the earth to witness these oddities. From the flat top tapuis of South America, to the sandy beaches of Australia. Carnivorous plants can be found across the world, and with carnivorous plants becoming ever more available, we no longer need to travel the world to see these amazing adaptations. We can grow them ourselves. We can grow them indoors, outside, or like in today's episode, a terrarium. So, without further ado, I welcome you to the very first episode of Hypnotic Exotics. Terrariums can be a wonderful way to grow carnivorous plants. Your mind is the limit. It's like having your own vicious jungle in a jar. But unfortunately, a lot of people fail to grow these plants this way. And most failures can be associated with giving the plant either too little or too much of what it requires. The plants could grow mold, have their roots die from nutrient buildup, or simply just outgrow their enclosure. So to avoid failure, we need to recognize and account for as much as we can. It's a lot, but we need to plan for things like our soil. How much water is going to be in there? How much light do our plants need? What temperatures do our inhabitants require? How are we going to maintain a high humidity? How are we going to ensure fresh airflow? I will be covering all of these during the construction of our Australian utopia. And don't forget to stay tuned till the end of our episode for the revealing of our peculiar inhabitants. So first things first, what are we going to need? Well, you're going to need a glass tank or jar. PVC pipe, some window screen, a light fixture, a light bulb with a minimum color of 5000 Kelvin and a minimum lux of 1.5 thousand, a small fan, a timer, some quartz rock, tumbled preferably as that removes a good bit of dissolved solids or dissolvable solids, sphagnum peat moss, quartz or silica sand, and perlite. We intend to make what is called a planted terrarium. So not only would we have to choose the correct soil for all plants involved, but layer it in such a way that wards off rot and promotes root growth for all inhabitants. Simply put, we're building a moisture gradient that permeates through an airy, sandy soil. To achieve our moisture gradient, we will line the bottom of our jar with one to two pounds of tumbled quartz rock. The quartz itself is inert and only acts as a support for our first layer of sand. After that, we are going to cut five pieces of PVC pipe as tall as your layer of quartz as well as one piece that is as tall as you want your soil to be at its highest point. Once we have these cut, we can hot glue some window screen over an end of each of our pieces. This window screen will prevent our media from getting into our water reservoir. As you can see, I'm gluing squares on prior and then trimming as that's just honestly easier. Now that we have our wicks completed, we can glue them down to the base of our terrarium. The placing doesn't matter as they're essentially just sponge. I opted to keep them away from the edge of the glass and hide them with some quartz. 
and don't forget to add your tallest piece of PVC pipe. This piece is crucial as we're going to be using it to both fill our terrarium with water and also empty it. An optional step once we have all our PVC and quartz placed is to add a layer of window screen. The layer of window screen will hold our layer of coarse sand above it and prevent any from falling through obstructing the view of our water. This is purely for aesthetic purposes and you can move straight to the sand and just fill up all the gaps if needed. And voila! We are now able to provide a stable, safe source of water for our inhabitants. From here, we will lay our media. I've chosen to mimic the soil composition of a sandy beachside bog in Australia, home to many species of carnivorous plants. And before we start, I'd just like to say no potting soil, no enriched soil, and especially no miracle grow. Now our first layer is going to be a half inch to an inch of rinsed sand. I've chosen to sift mine with some extra window screen to prevent it from falling into my reservoir, but the sifting is not necessary for this step. Our next layer is going to be a little less dense with a 1 to 1 ratio of rinsed sand and perlite. I'm essentially trying to emulate the stones and other hard debris that can be found under the layer of topsoil. The perlite itself decreases compaction and promotes airflow through the media. My layer is about an inch to an inch and a half in depth. We're now going to throw down a layer of rinsed sand, perlite, and peat moss, mixed at a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. The peat moss will act as a moisture loving sponge, pulling water up to the surface without pulling any away from the plants. This is going to be our secondary soil layer, where the roots will enter as the plants mature. It's now time for our final layer of soil, a 2 to 1 to 1 ratio of peat, rinsed sand, and perlite. This layer is actually crucial to get correct as it's going to be the layer that most of our plants are going to be potted in. We can now fill our terrarium to the top of our tallest PVC pipe with this. And once filled with soil and happy with our topography, we can top it off with a final dressing of rinsed sand. This is going to help prevent crown rot in some of our plants. Once we're done with that, we could begin filling our water reservoir with about a half inch of water that's been filtered by reverse osmosis or just simply uh, parts per million under 50. You can siphon the excess water if you would like, but I'm using a kerosene pump from Ace Hardware. Way easier. Keeping humidity high is something that's often struggled with as well among the carnivorous plant community, but fortunately with our build, we have a couple solutions to that problem. We can mist our enclosure regularly. We could hook it up to a humidifier or even just put a lid on it. But I'm going the pretty route, with a colony of live red sphagnum moss at the base of our terrain. Don't go throwing plants in there just yet. We now need to provide ample light. Generally, the rule of thumb is to provide more than 1500 lux and definitely more than 5000k in color. 6500 is preferred. I'm gonna be saying this plenty of times throughout the series, but do the math. Figure out how high your light will be what your observable angle of light is, the lumens, and throw it all in an online calculator. It's easy, keeps things cheap, and I got mine with plenty of light for $17. Now, we've put all this effort into this terrarium, but for how long will it stay like this? Will it stay lush and clean? Or will it end up overgrown and look like a poorly packaged eBay purchase? Fortunately, we don't have to wonder about that, because it's now time to reveal what species I've chosen to occupy our carnivorous wonderland. For our first occupant, I've chosen a Cephalotus follicularis. I felt this was a perfect choice for our terrarium due to its small growth habit and slow growth speed. My second occupant is a sundew, known as Drosera adelae. I've specifically chosen the giant form because of its deep red leaves. I'm not worried about this plant outgrowing our terrarium, simply because our terrarium enclosure is so large. Keeping up with the Australian theme is Tracera Burmanii Humpty Doo. The Humpty Doo variety is a special deep red form of Tracera Burmanii from Humpty Doo Australia. 
After that, I've chosen Drosera pacella. It is a small pygmy Drosera native to Australian acid and peat bogs. Pygmy Drosera are known for creating tons of flowers and gimme, as well as carpeting their entire enclosure. Our final occupant is going to be a bladderwort, known as Utricularia sandersonii. This carnivorous bladderwort is native to Australia and known for its prolific flowers. I have specifically chosen a blue flowered variety for contrast. All five species love moist, sandy soil, high humidity, and high light. The cephalotus and smaller sundews are quite susceptible to rot, so we created a moisture gradient with a small fan providing airflow. The utricularia itself will be able to utilize the larger surface area we've created with all our topography and slopes. And the different compositions of soil will allow me to try out plants at different zones of the terrarium. And after a lot of thought, I've finally chosen a name for the home of our peculiar plants. An underwhelming but predictable name of Humpty Doo. Don't forget to tune in for part two where I'll be giving comprehensive care tips about our new occupants and planting them in our new home of Humpty Doo. Thank you for watching. Please leave feedback and don't forget to like and subscribe. Plant love.